Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, that's good. Because after the pandemic, after the COVID-19, I think, can you hear me is a better replacement of good afternoon or good to see you. And I think probably later on when we say, oh, I couldn't hear you, the reception is bad, is a better replacement of goodbye. Um, but anyway, thank you. Thank you very much to OCC, ACCF, and thank you to President uh, Chen, President Guo, to allow me to have this opportunity to present my personal experience and understanding of uh, 5G and artificial intelligence. And that's something I believe I have been doing for more than 20 years. And uh, it's something I definitely feel excited and want to share with you guys. And now, can you see the shared screen? Particularly right now, I show the first page of my presentation, the era of AI and NG. Can you guys see this? Yes. Yeah. Great. Then I will just move to the second one. And the reason I didn't um, put the AI and 5G on my first page, and instead I put my resume, and what it's not called a resume, a piece of information about myself, because I want to first say something, and that is the foundation of pursuing AI or 5G if you are eventually interested in them. Um, you can see I got my master's and PhDs in computer science from Carnegie Mellon and my BS in wireless communication from UESDC in China. So that put me in a better position to speak something about 5G and AI altogether. And in 2015, I established a company called Ice Credit. And um, that was uh, listed as Global FinTech 250 by CB Insights, etc. And I'm also affiliated professor at Southeast University, UESTC, and UC Irvine. Um, but why I'm saying this? Because this is the point I want to make. Even I have been in business for many years, but I'm not work a single day in flag. When we talk about the flag, and uh, at that time, and we put Facebook, LinkedIn, Apple, and Google all together. But now LinkedIn is gone. LinkedIn is already acquired by Microsoft. So we only just uh, say three company, and now probably we have Amazon. Probably we have uh, new companies. But uh, anyway, this is we just uh, put uh, a symbol for tech companies. I didn't work a single day in all these great, great tech companies. And instead, starting from day one after my PhD graduation, I started to work with Merrill Lynch. And since then, I work for investment banking and working for hedge fund and working for VC. So not a single day in, F, uh, in flag, but every single day in FinTech. And that, means, that gave me a unique experience to understand how can we transform the technologies in business. And in addition, since 2013, and I count every day, it's already almost seven years, I fly between China, Europe, and the US every month. So every year, I easily accumulated more than 200,000 miles. So in the past seven years, I accumulated 1.4 million miles. Every time when I board, I always got an opportunity to see the captain. That is pretty interesting. <laughs> and, uh, but let me go back and go back to the foundation of my point. And uh, every single day, and if you still have a dream in your heart, and you should pursue it, and then no matter what is the current path you take, and that's the last line and on this page, and before I departed from Shanghai International Airport in Pudong, and that's 20 years ago in 2000, and before my flew to the US, I just write a very small note and on my notebook, of course, it's not a MacBook, it's a notebook. It's a really a piece of paper notebook. And I put my career path there. And my first goal, I got a top tier university PhD. I done it, I achieved it. And the second goal, and achieve a faculty position in a top tier university. And you can see, I didn't do it. And then the third one, I want to be a, a triple E ACM fellow. Did I? Of course not. And final, probably, touring on Nobel laureate. Maybe for the rest of my life, I couldn't achieve it. But that is my goal. That's 20 years ago. And that was my goal. And that goal is still and in my heart. And I believe, even right now, I'm running my own business. But every day, I'm still publishing paper. 
I'm still generating new patents. Now I have uh, 23 patents and I have uh, numbers in numerous papers and in different conference and uh, publications and journals because I believe that is eventually my goal. And one day I think I definitely, I will quit my chairman and CEO role and I will go back to university to be a professor and be with my students and for the rest of my life. So that's what I'm saying. If you really, really think something and that's you want to pursue and stick with it, no matter if you have financial difficulty or if you have something temporarily, you couldn't just achieve it and you have to take a detour. Eventually, you should come back. So that's something I want to share with you at the first point. And now, and then let's look at uh, my second page and that's waves of technology revolution and that is also one of my topic i want to talk about the revolution and evolution and in long run people are only talking about us human being and we are doing evolution and for the society for our country and for the past the hundreds thousands of years and we want through revolution but now i think it's completely get the other way around and for human being, we are going through revolution. And but for society, we are going to evolution. Why do I say this? And let's go back and just stand on giant's shoulders and look back for the first wave of revolution. And of course, that's a steam engine. And that's about 1840s. And what is that? I think a lot of people only talking about the steam engine, only talk about the train. But I would just summarize this into the physical object movement and that's something for the first revolution before that and we have to move a physical object in years in months or probably in days but after that and we can very easily shorten the time period to move physical objects and from continent to continent from coast to coast and that's the benefit we enjoy for the first revolution and how about the second revolution and that's telephone and the telegram. And even right now, AT&T is still a great company, but compared to 100 years ago, and it's totally different. But we still cannot just uh, see anything bad about the contribution of this company because they brought the second wave of revolution, and that's what we call the physical information movement. Think about if you went back in Ming Dynasty or in Qing Dynasty, and you got number one, in national college entrance examination. Well, in China, we call it Dian Shi, right? And that happened in Nanjing or probably in Beijing. But maybe your hometown is in Chengdu, Sichuan, or maybe in Guiyang. And you don't have telephone, you don't have telegram. And it took probably easily for three months for your mom, for your dad to know you achieved this goal. But after telephone and the telegram, that's in seconds. So that's what we call the physical information movement. And what is the third revolution? That's internet. Internet, and particularly the internet wave, and happened in the beginning of 1990s. And in that case, and we can easily transmit the widths and the depths of information, not just from telegram, from Morse code, not from telephone, only just to hear your voice, but cannot see you. And from internet, I can send you email, and that is exactly the way I got the admission, and I got the scholarship and fellowship from Carnegie Mellon. And before, I have to mail, and it took at least a week across the Pacific Ocean to achieve the admission office. But after the internet, I can easily just click a button and send my resume and application materials, and that was gorgeous. Right now, when we look back, it looks like a little bit ridiculous. But in the beginning of 1990s, that's really great. And the fourth revolution, and right now it's happening, and that's digital currency. We talk about Bitcoin, we talk about XRP, and we talk about a lot of alternative coins, and what are they? And they try to achieve another goal. That's what we call the physical wealth movement, because previously we have to use a SWIFT. If you want to send money from China to the US, send money from the US to Europe. And it takes at least several days for you to achieve that. And you have to write your home bank's SWIFT code 
and the receiving banks swift code and sometimes for stupid banks and you have to put their physical address contact information a lot of things etc but now if you try to just transfer money through a bitcoin or xrp that's in seconds so that is completely changing entire of our society and the world and what is the fifth revolution oh god finally i come to my topic that's ai and ng why i always say ng i'm not saying 5g because i'm not a strong believer to 5g and you are going to see my next page 5g will be short lived and we're going to see 6g 7g and even 10g 5g is just temporary it will not long why i'm saying this later on i will do it and for this page and my last point of course not to the least is elon musk's ambition and this is the guy is going to change the world and he i think personally is even better than steve jobs steve jobs just changed our computer change our phone change our ipad that's it but all this we can live and still live happily without all this but look at elon musk's three company solar city tesla and the spacex why only this is three why not the fourth why not the fifth because he wants to achieve his ambition to land and immigrate to mars and for the solar city and he used the solar energy and on mars instead of on earth and we don't have a petroleum we don't have wind and we have to 100% rely on solar that's why he put solar city second on mars and there is no oxygen so we cannot use gas and we cannot burn gas we cannot burn coal and how do we do it we have to put the battery into the car that's tesla so that's the transportation on mars and the third one how can we get to mars and we need a spacex we need a space shuttle and that's the dragon and that's everything currently he's putting and that's the reason i'm saying and probably at the beginning of the 21st century elon musk will be definitely of unforgot of unforgettable person and he is amazing and now let's move to the 5g see i said it before i don't believe 5g will be the final things and it's not the end because why let's look at the history of our wireless communication first g last for really long time and we use our telephone and uh, it's uh, not very slow but uh, it's not very reliable and sometimes it's just a landline and there is no cell phone and the 2g 2g is shot 2g is was quickly replaced by 3g and the 3g and actually lasted pretty long time and until oh, no sorry 2g lasted really long time and until we see 3g and the 3g didn't last really long time even i put from 1990 to 2002 but and you can think about that if you or probably your parents had experience to use that it's okay but not very reliable and if we use 4g and for the past four or maybe six years and you can see that's really cool you can download a movie and you can video chatting and you can do a lot of things why because cdma is very mature and this cdma or ofda is very very robust compared to the 3g analogy now everyone is talking about 5g then people say why 5g will be eventually replacing 4g and for that point i absolutely agree with that because i list the pros here number one fast it's way faster than 4g and any previous generation no question about that that's absolutely true and then number two reliable and in this reliable is the truly meaning reliable you will not lose a single data package and there will be no bad reception and the number three energy saving and the problem you will see energy saving is really a big big concern now we have solar city right we have the solar energy and we have endless coal and we have a natural gas we have petroleum and the people right now they have the mind thinking about energy saving so energy saving is really interesting or important yes because we are talking about the sensor we are talking about the sensor and in millions of place in cities and in rural area and if we don't do energy saving probably for every day you have to replace the battery but for 5g it consume very little energy it can put your device last 
years and without changing the battery. And that's really cool. And that's why we see 5G is great. And for applications, like uh, Professor Fan said before, autonomous driving is a really great way. 4G, there is no way. And you have to detect the object in front of you and transmit the signal back to the computer and let the algorithm calculate and give you the instant decision immediately. For 4G, I find the, the object in front of me. Stop your car. Yes, stop, bam. The accident already happened, so that's too slow. And we need 5G and in seconds to do everything. For remote medical surgery, and that's something without 5G, you cannot do it. And when you talk to some patient miles, thousands of miles away, say, hey, hold on, stop. And the surgery has already started, and that is going to be a big disaster. And for augmented reality, sensor-based smart city, everything is about 5G. But probably right now, by looking at these uh, slides, and you will see, huh, interesting. You're only talking about the pros. Are there any cons? Yes. I will give you two things. In 5G, instead of 4G, it takes three seconds to download a full resolution or high resolution movie in three seconds, which means in one minute, you can download 20 movies. But I would say this is absolutely a call. It's a problem. And it's going to humiliate yourself because in one minute, you have downloaded 20 minutes, you have downloaded 20 movies, but it will take you an hour to think about which movie you are going to watch. That is going to be a big problem for you. So you are going to have the problem of selection. And also, and probably before, and uh, you don't want to talk to your mom and you think just your mom consumed too much of your time. Every time you can use the excuse, mom, sorry, the reception is bad. I couldn't hear you, I got to go, bye bye. Now you don't have this excuse anymore because there is no going to be bad reception and no single data package will be lost. Your mom clearly can hear you. So this excuse, we're gone, I'm sorry. So those are definitely the cons. So this is something my understanding about 5G. And uh, due to the limitation of the time, I have to go to my last page about artificial intelligence. Like I said, in 2000, I started my PhD, computer, uh, PhD in computer science at Carnegie Mellon. And that was 20 years ago. And uh, AI was not hot at all. And people were not talking about artificial intelligence a lot at that, those days. People talking about the biomedical engineering, they were talking about wireless communications, and AI was not hot at all. And but uh, just to follow Professor Fan's topic, and she mentioned that Herbert Simon and mentioned Alan Newell. And just um, it's it's great honor for Carnegie Mellon because Carnegie Mellon had the honor to have both of them as professors. And they worked at CMU for a really long time. And the first time I arrived at CMU, and my office was in the Simon Newell Hall. And just to honor these two professors. And that was really cool things and for me to spend six years there. But when we go back to look at uh, AI, AI is something, it's just not about only algorithm or only about data. And I put this equation here, and that is data times algorithm. Just by looking at one of them, and it gave us a huge impact. But to put them together is not just a plus, it's a multiplication. And that's, we see the power from AI because data and algorithm, they can reflect each other and they can augment each other. And that's really cool things for us to watch. And then the second thing, why? Probably you say, why 20 years ago, AI was not hot? And it shouldn't be obvious. It is a hot topic, right? Then I should just also give you a little bit history about generalized AI versus specialized AI. And the generalized AI was really hot in the 60s and in 20th centuries. Why? Because there was a very famous professor at MIT and his name is Marvin Minsky. Marvin Minsky passed away probably a year or two years ago and that was really sad. But he proposed the idea and eventually robots or algorithm where at least in terms of intelligence should be comparable to human. 
And that's the research area he always lead his team to do. And that's what we call the generalized AI. But of course, think about that. That's 80 years ago. If you want to do generalized AI, and there was no alpha go, there was uh, no alpha zero. And so, of course, a lot of failure. And eventually, people lost their confidence. And they think probably generalized AI way advanced to the current understanding. So they switch back. And that switch back took us at least 30 years. And in the 70s, in the 80s, and we were only talking about the neural networks. So if you just go back to 40, 50 years ago, and you look at IEEE transactions, look at ACM transactions, you only see all those uh, papers about neural networks. But neural networks cannot solve everything. So that's to you the beginning of the 90s, and we have another person, and he was born in Taiwan and grew up in the US and got his PhD in Carnegie Mellon too. His name is Kai-Fu Lee. And he proposed uh, something and we called hidden Markov models. Hidden Markov models and also he applied the uh, HMM into speech recognition and greatly increased the speech recognition accuracy from about uh, maybe 60% and all the way to 93%. That I called resolution instead of uh, evolution. Because previously, it's like you just flip a coin. 50 or 60% of accuracy means nothing. That's random. But now, 33% of accuracy really means, some, means something. So that's what uh, we call the, the, the beginning of specialized AI. And in the beginning of the 21st century, we have another new algorithm. And that we call the support of vector machines and the SVM. SVM, again, changes the landscape of uh, our research. And again, took another 10 years to the beginning of uh, 2010, and we see deep learning. So you can see, for algorithms, for research, it's really tough. Probably it's easily take you 10 years, only think about one topic, and you don't have bandwidth, you don't have additional energy to think about anything new. And the entire research society and brought new things and have to wait for at least 10 years. And now if we look back to uh, my PowerPoint by looking at this current slides, when we talk about AI, we typically talk about the four areas, pattern recognition, machine learning, and the data mining, and the algorithm. And right now, sometimes, and they are interchangeable, and we mixed, we mixed and mingle all these four concepts together, but eventually there are some hot topics and stand out by themselves. And that's what we call the deep learning, we call the nature language processing, which is NLP, and the knowledge graph, and the federated learning. And all those topics, and for each of them, I can spend easily a week to give you a tutorial and maybe give you uh, some course level knowledge. But because I only have 20 minutes, so I will just skip and to the final thing, and examples. Because every time when we talk about AI, I would always like to give some examples to show you the pros and the cons of AI. But again, it's not about the mom joke. It's not about the download the movie joke. That's the seriously the example and the seriously the pros and cons. AI is great. AI uses millions of features and put the feature engineering together and goes through different algorithms to give us either the linear or nonlinear boundary of our decision. And that is great. But sometimes think about that. What is AI? AI is completely data and algorithm driven, like I mentioned in, the, in this current page. So that gave us something to think about. Does it really reflect the causality or only reflect the correlation? I think eventually that also answer another potential question you may ask. Eventually, do you believe robot will replace our human beings? And my answer is no. Because even at this stage, and we already see the power of AI, I still believe they can only explore the correlation. And they do not have a strong ability or capability to explore the causality. And let me give you several examples. First, and when we done a very on purpose experiment. I just show people some data. And on one side, 
and we say, you see the number of uh, people to do swimming and on the other side, and you see the number of people and got drawn and dead. And another you see number of uh, people and they started to buy the ice cream. And then you see all these numbers just go up at the same time. So eventually, if you run a logistic regression, and that easily gave you the conclusion because the number of people increase to buy ice cream. And that result, the number of people draw in their swimming pool. And so buying ice cream is the reason for people to be dead in swimming pool. And do you believe that? Absolutely not, because the result is ridiculous. It's unreasonable. Why? Because we only see the correlation. We don't see the causality. What is the causality? The causality is what we call the internal and hidden layer of variable, and that is the temperature. Because the temperature increase, the number of people buying ice cream increase, number of people to go swim increase, of course, the number of more accidents happened. So see, that is a perfect example to show causality is not equal to the correlation. And the second, and probably you already learned this example from a lot of textbook, and that's diapers and the beers. And that experiment actually was done by targets. And it's really surprising to see, oh my God, what happened? Why if I see the sales of diaper increase, I also see the sales of beer increase. What does that mean? Does that mean people wear diaper to drink beer? No, of course not. Then what happened? Because mom was busy at home to take care of babies. So only dad go to supermarket to do shopping. And they buy diapers and they think, oh, it's perfect time for me to buy some beer to enjoy my time. So they buy diapers and beer all together. And so that is the reason. But that has nothing to do with the diaper and the beer. And finally, and the last example I want to give is I'm personally a big fan of uh, football. And so I know so many and follow so many professional teams in AFC and NFC. And if you just uh, try to run at all this historical data and try to get some indication about uh, the final national champion and uh, to our stock market, and you will be surprised to find the result is very interesting. If NFC team finally wins the national champion, and we have a very great chance to see our stock market win go up in the next year. If you see AFC won the championship, and sorry, you better just put all the money into the money market instead of buying the stocks. Does that really tell us something? And do you think that is really the reason? If that is the reason, and we are going to put down all teams in AFC and always let the NFC win the championship, and do you think our economy will go up every year? No, it's not. Then later on, and I ask my team, continue to dig more data into it, try to find out what happened and for this. And typically, you know, for AFC, because I live in Pittsburgh for so many years, and I'm really, really big fan of Steelers. So I really hate New England Patriots. I'm sorry if there are any fans from New England Patriots. But in all this, and we call from East Coast and from a very cold place, particularly Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and all this, and we call it, this is the, the Rust Belt, right? And if you look at NFC, and you look at Los Angeles Rams, you look at uh, San Francisco 49ers, and you look at the Seattle Hawks, etc. And all this, Seahawks, and all this, and they are in the sunny belts. So that is the new economy versus the old economy. So if US economy is in a down run, and you will see AFC got more money, and that's the reason for that year, AFC will stand out eventually. And on the other way around, and then we will see the NFC. But eventually, again, I still said, this is probably still part of the reason. And if we really dig into deeply into the data and use our algorithm to understand. So at this point, I'm not very concerned about AI will replace human being. It will be a good argument. It will be a good assistance. But if we talk about the replace us, probably we still have to go back into movies to imagine that in reality, in our daily life, it will not happen 
in near future. And I think that's all I want to share today. And again, I want to thank you everyone. And I also want to pass my congratulations to the current and the past recipient. And you are great and you are the hope and you are the future of our country. I'm really proud of you guys. Congratulations.